I'm Jennifer Gilmore and I'm an author and advocate for women in abusive relationships. I want to get to the answers to the questions that many have from those that work in the domestic abuse sector, getting an inside feel of what it's really like in their job role and sharing it with all of you. Hi everyone and welcome to the next um, in the series of Hashtag Abuse Talk interviews. I'm really delighted to have Diane Colsell here with me today and who, um, do you know what, I'm not going to introduce too much because it's better to hear it from Diane herself. So Diane, can you tell us <laughs> a bit about you and what you do and why I'm interviewing you really? <laughs> right, I'm Diane. Um... Diane Colesell and I'm from Melloland Therapies and I support ladies who are either going through domestic abuse relationships or people who have left abusive relationships to regain their self-confidence, rebuild their life and go and make it into what they want to and that is also finding new accommodation, um, dealing with emotions, um, self-worth, um, the whole package because it's not just about leaving the relationship um there's lots of things that come up that you'll need to work through also the financial side of it if you've had a joint account and oh i've got no money now where do you get your money from you know going through the benefit system am i entitled to any benefits you know and if you're not perhaps you know looking at different avenues that you can make money from you know um so yeah total support package really Wow, that sounds like, you know, something that you just need um, coming out of that relationship because it is um, like, where do you turn or who can answer these questions? Um, so can I ask you why, what, what led you to want to help um, people in this sort of position or situation? Right, well, I was in an abusive relationship for 20 years. Um, well, coming up 20 years, it was 19, in fact. Um, yeah, from sexual abuse, violent, um, emotional abuse and physical abuse as well. So the full spectrum that you can actually go through. And when one thing stopped working, he started doing something else. Um, and it did, did actually go in cycles as well. Um, there is an actual well-known abuse cycle that they go through, um, which, you know, should people contact me, we can look at that in more detail and it will help them to understand you know um that it wasn't them being stupid that they were stuck in this relationship because it's all a part of an emotional cycle that they think they're you know they're being nice to you so you go oh well they didn't really mean what they did yesterday you know and stuff like that so i was in in abuse relationship 20 years and i left six years ago on the 6th of june so i've just come up my sixth anniversary um yeah, and um, actually making that final decision to jump ship that day was so hard. And if I'd have had a support network, I'd have done it probably at least by year 10. I wouldn't have stayed another 10 years, to be honest with you. But I didn't have any fam fam family to support me because every time I went to them to say that he'd come at me with a knife, they were like, we're not getting involved. We Basically, I think they were scared of him as well um and he kind of got round to getting to my friends and saying stuff to them and turning them against me and then when they text me some people text me or my family spoke to me on the phone he'd interrogate me afterwards um so you know it was full on and I ended up in I ended up having a breakdown actually and an attempt suicide um, and I ended up in a local hospital. I can't remember how long I was there for. Um, he was basically in control of whether I came out or stayed in there. Um, when they released me from the general hospital, he said, I'm not taking you home. Um, so they said, well, what do we do with her now? Well, I want her to go to a psychiatric hospital. Um, and that was even worse, knowing that, you know, he was in control of that as well. Um, and he actually said to me, you'd have stayed in there forever if I hadn't got you out. But they released me back to his abuse. 
Um, and then I had a CPN and she kept coming round. And one day she came round after he'd punched me in the face and split my lip open. And they still really didn't do anything. So, you know, it, and, and then it just got into complete survival mode. So, yeah, that's, that's why I want to support people because sometimes I feel the system is not there. And I feel having had the experience myself, I can give so much more to someone than, than someone that's just read a book, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. and, and read the, the, I can't say that word, the statistics, okay? And, and you know, you are one of 10 or something, you know, because statistics generally, they don't mean tosh, to be honest with you, because people really, it doesn't really mean anything. They need to talk to me and, um, yeah, we can get you through it one step at a time. Well, thank you for sharing this, Diane. I mean, I, I, I kind of see your whole point of the whole, oh, the, it, you can read a textbook but not fully understand. And for me, sometimes I think of it as there's people out there that can support you in different ways. So, for example, I've gone through domestic abuse and I know that there's a, a set amount of people that will understand my thought, you know, my thoughts and the way I think and the way I process things um but they might not necessarily understand um the feelings and the emotions exactly the same kind of um thought process as to when i lost a baby and so i have a set group of people for yeah you have your different cluster of people yeah. yeah and i think it's really important it becomes like sort of a you know toolkit in, in in a sense and um your the work that you do will be important because you will have that em empathy um yeah sometimes yeah. It's quite lacking um so thank you and um, so um i have asked people um que to ask questions as well and um, because i think it's important for people to have that ability and obviously they're able to do that anonymously through this uh, process and so yeah. what, one of the questions that i had was um what what does your process or and um, technique look like so if um i don't know somebody came to you that was either in the situation or coming out you know how would you maybe handle that in, in your process right well it it really depends on where they are and whether they're leaving where they are in themselves as in are they still in the relationship are they leaving or have they left so there's two very different areas there um if they're still in the relationship, it's all about keeping them safe. If they can't actually physically, is it possible for them to leave? Because, um, you know, there are certain times that you have to stay in the relationship because there is no other option. Um, and then it might be that, you know, I can stay with them, support them until they are able to leave. Um, and then when they leave, I can support them rebuilding their life. You know, it's not, a, I'm only going to be here for a month for you. I'm going to be here for as long as it takes for us to feel that you're okay, you know? Um, so yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, where, where are you? So we do an initial assessment of where are you, but if you are in the abusive relationship, we need to make sure that your abuser doesn't know where you're going. Yeah. So we meet at a secret location and we find a way that they're not going to be able to get hold of your mobile phone, find a way to communicate that they're not going to be able to get hold of your mobile phone and your conversations. I've got a secret Facebook, Facebook group. Um, that people could actually join. There's only two members, I think actually you and somebody else at the moment, but I need to find a way to get people to my group and then we can communicate better and that's a more safe place for them to meet me mm. and for us to do work. Um, can I give you the name of my group now? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so it's called Domestic Abuse, Survivors and Living in Group. So that encompasses everything that I'm about and what I'm trying to achieve because I'm not condoning that you are in that relationship because I know that you just have to stay sometimes. Mm. So it's about trying to help you make the best of the situation you've got and stay safe mm. as well, you know. So 
it's a support network it's a, a chat group it's that's what i intend it to be um i'm just kind of getting to the stage now that i can dedicate a bit more time to it now i feel that i've moved on and you know this kind of feels like a different life that i've got now and did i really did i did it really happen to me and did i dream about you know what's happened but i get do get constant reminders of like you know what people do to me um or say to me quite innocently and i get triggers and stuff like that so yeah we can work through why do i feel like this why do i get these reactions as well you know you can probably understand that and also your perception of what people say to you in a normal conversation that you overanalyze it and you go i think they're being abusive to me and whereas we we do become highly sensitive if we've been in that situation Mm. um don't we and sometimes we do misread messages when we're not in an abusive relationship because so i found it really hard with my new partner that i've been with for five years and he says to me you still don't trust me do you and i'm like well i'm kind of trying to mm. you know and i'm there's days i do and days i don't and he's not doing anything horrible but just sometimes my body goes <laughs> And I go into that freeze panic attack mode of like, or even because he's being so good, I'm like, are you going to go into a down eye? Are you going to go into spiral? When are you going to go to this bad phase? You know? So yeah, um, it's, it's work in progress. <laughs> oh. well, again, it's that, um, it's that empathetic feel, that understanding that everybody needs. And, um, you know, it's nice to hear that you're, in that you know a new relationship as well um i agree on the massive learning curve that it is <laughs> yeah it sure is <laughs> it's, impo it's important to share that side because um there is life after domestic abuse you can but that's made me go tingly but um but the point i want to make is because i've had full-on abuse for so long and even my up bringing wasn't particularly good that was narcissistic and i had uh basically i don't i still haven't connected with he was an alcoholic but he was definitely self-medicating and it definitely ran the family the fact that he drunk he wasn't drunk all the time but he needed it to get through his depression mm. um so yeah so it's just like i've lost my train of thought <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right, don't worry. We're talking about uh, new relationships. Oh, um, yeah, new relationships. Sometimes you, um, I feel really hollow and empty, and that's because I haven't got that. And I've heard a lot of people talk about they can't cope with a new relationship or a nice relationship because it feels empty, because right. all they're feeling is peace and love, maybe. Hopefully both. Um, Whereas they've constantly been touching on eggshells, thinking about what what should I say, what shouldn't I say, is it going to hit me, you know, um, and constantly being on guard, which takes up a lot of your energy. So, you know, when when you are in a nice relationship, you're kind of like, oh, hang on, I've got, I've got, I'm calm, you know, or my, your brain, your brain monkey goes, what the hell's going on? This is really boring. No, this isn't really boring. This is probably quite normal, but you haven't been used to having normal. And, you know. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's like learning to love again, isn't it? That's how I feel. Yeah, and, and learning yourself, learning to love yourself as well, yeah. Okay, well, we've, we've spoken about um, your personal experiences and everything, um, but I know you've, you've told me, but could you share with everyone about um you know the qualifications you have gained um on this journey that you're on um that sort of equips you to take on this role really right um well i have 53 years of life actually skills <laughs> um i'm also a mental health first aider um i've done some work with women's aid in hemel Hempstead, um just being with the ladies um the service the service users do we call them that yeah the service users um they've got a lot of um young families in there who have come out from london um the refugees in hemel Hempstead, so it's just far enough away but a lot of the families were going through family courts 
Um, so yeah, um, just giving them time, perhaps an hour of my time to actually, I used to go there on a Friday afternoon, um, just to actually sit with them if they wanted, just to hold their hands sometimes, you know, if they needed that human connection away from all the turmoil that they're going through, because obviously bringing your kids up, being going through the court systems, you know, trying to find a new house, etc. you know, um, in an unfamiliar environment, they've got to make sure the kids are okay as well. So that special hour away from, you know, the kids going, mum, why are we here? Blah, 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 blah. Cause some of them had only been there a week, you know, settling in and stuff. So yeah, or just give them Reiki cause I'm a holistic therapist as well. So Reiki, you're calming, you're cleansing or reflexology or a massage, you know, stuff like that. So just something to make them feel a little bit special for that hour or even half an hour, if that's what they wanted. Yes, that sounds um, great. And, um, yeah. sorry, can I, just say this as well um yeah i've done training with papyrus which is prevention of youth suicide um yeah so i do one-to-ones i do group i do text messaging um so that would be again with um the abuse you could do text messaging with me if you felt that that would be a safe option um, obviously not to put yourself at risk but um, yeah and I'm a mental health first aider with um, mind so I trained with them as well. That's great thank you. Um, well as I've said I've had questions from people and one of the questions um, that I've been asked to ask you is how do you approach topics that might be triggering um, to clients? Um right well my interviewing techniques when i meet them so my consultation techniques won't actually ask you the direct question yes well what about um if you learn about a client and obviously it's a subject that you have uh, you know adopted um but i suppose they they might unknowingly um bring something to the table that could be triggering to them can you i don't know see the signs of that or i think that's yeah, some of... sometimes you see a facial expression or uh you know but the body language changes so um sometimes people shut down when they try to talk about stuff because i'm feeling like a little bit talking about some this subject actually because i've not really done it um so yeah we can do a lot of journaling we can do drawing pictures there's lots of tools that we can do which take it away from your brain going i don't want to talk about this um yeah so probably the initial one is um the map of life have you seen that one we'd probably do that first for it's like a circle with different segments and then you just um there's certain things in it which would be on this subject and then you put like number one is the most important and number 10 no, is the least important and number 10 is the most important in your life at the moment yeah and we'd yeah. probably work on that um with the different tools that i have in my toolbox so it wouldn't be like oh so you whatever and a direct question to you we'd do it you know um softly we're all on about we're about softly doing it not you know firing questions at you and expecting you to have all the answers because sometimes you have to take the layers of the onion away and i know that's a bit of a cliche one but you have to take the barriers down start unpeeling the onion layers and then see where you are at every layer really so it's yeah it's definitely a process <laughs> no, I, I think the onion is still relevant even though it's uh, a <laughs> i think it's i think it's very relevant i think it's a nice description of how it can be done yes um okay so i've got another question from somebody and they've asked um do you um know if the police have a therapist on call um and that they can offer to someone who may be in need of that particular service Right, well, in Oxfordshire, I know they had, as in the police-wise, I know they had um, 
a specific domestic violence um, section. Right. Um, because the day that I finally left my husband, um, the police came to see me and I was a domestic violence section over Chinar, now in Hertfordshire. I think they probably do as well, but I couldn't be specific because it depends on different areas to be honest with you, where you are as to whether they've got funding, etc. Mm. But they were very, very good um, in supporting me initially when I made that final call, because up until that point, I hadn't really contacted the police. But um, this particular, when I was living over in Hemel Hempstead, um, this particular, what can I call it? This particular time, um, it was just escalating out of control. So I picked the phone up um, off the windowsill and I dialed 999 and he snatched the phone out of my hand and that dialed through to the police. Right. Um, and he didn't know that. And um, anyway, the silly police had their siren going. So he knew there was a police car going somewhere. So they came knocking at our door. Right. Um, but yeah, they were very, they were very, very good. Um, they came knocking at the door and he said, has there been there? Uh, the policeman said, has there been an altercation here? And he said, no. And he was quite a big chap and he was blocking the doorway. And they said, well, we believe there has. Can we, um, can we step inside? And I was stood behind him and they could see me because I was going like this over his shoulder. Um, so yeah, so they said, oh, can, can I come in? And they took him to one room and took me to the other. And they said, do, do you feel safe tonight? And I said, to be honest, I don't, you know, I don't want to stay here any longer. Um, so they said, is there a safe place you can go tonight? And I said, well, I don't know, to be honest. But I said, I'm going to go over my sisters. So they said, do you want us to have a proper interview, uh, you know, proper chat with you over there? And I said, yeah. So, so they, they contacted the Oxfordshire people when they came out to me. So I'm hoping, I mean, this is like um, 13 years ago. So I was about 40 when, um, when this actually happened, I think. No, I'm a bit on time. No, I had my breakdown when I was 40. So I'm 53 now. So that was 13 years ago. Wow. And then, um, sorry, I'm waffling on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure. um, the one at the window I was like, Who is that? oh right I thought he was looking at the time <laughs> no. um so yeah so no that was a bit fizzy that no I was mixing it up with my but yeah that was six years ago and they did actually come to my sister's house and said if I needed any support any more support um but I do believe there's that they are trying to get people domestic abuse people um to sort support people in hospitals i don't know how far they've got with that so if you were to go to a and e um i think they they're trying to work on that but um i'm a little bit i'm not quite sure what's going on in certain areas um because that you know it's all in the media and i think they're trying to get the funding together and the staff to um, cause it is, it is quite, I know doctors and nurses can touch on it, but they're more about physical, have they hit you, blah, 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 aren't they? So, you know, a lot of people need the emotional support and I can't actually answer that as to whether it's in the specific regions that people are in. It might be more about them finding out for themselves, really. Yeah, I think it's um, it's, it's a bit different because uh, one part of the country can be, look very different to, to another part of the country, which is uh, difficult if you are trying to reach out to people, um, as, as the whole of the UK say, and then it's sort of a bit frustrating because what might be offered in, in East Yorkshire, where I am, is not offered where... I mean, there seems so much of what I've been following you, there seems so much more where you are than where I am at the moment. I think um, it's it's all done on risk. So for for Hull um, City anyway, the, um, they all they support medium and high risk. Whereas if you go maybe an hour in the other direction, they will. Only am I in the lower risk area then? So they don't see the need for it. Then maybe but yeah. It's really frustrating because it um, if I hadn't have gained that support as a medium risk person then I think I would have struggled with my emotional well-being and being able to get 
pass that through uh, the recovery kind of stage. Yeah, yeah. The ability to re recover because I wouldn't have had the program that I went on, for example. So yeah. It's kind of frustrating and it kind of leads me on to so to what I wanted to ask you as well is do you personally get any support from like any local funding or is it are you are you only privately run I'm only privately run I am looking um I I want to take this out worldwide I want to take it out to schools and colleges and um corporate because um my domestic abuse did actually really affect me at work um, you know, he made me go in with a split lip and I said, so what happens if, you know, what, I don't give a shit what people think. If you'd have done as you were told, you wouldn't have had it, you know, and it did affect my, oh my God, um, it's five o'clock, I've got to go back home. And like, you know, from what happened the day before, you know, I wasn't concentrating on my work. So if there was, say, a counsellor or someone in the workplace for someone just to go do you know what I get what you're saying yeah come and talk to me for half an hour you know when you're when you're in survival mode you don't necessarily tune in that there is somewhere you can go to get help mm. you know because you are in survival mode you're in a frenzy aren't you um so yes, it might just be that stepping stone that you get if you were at work and you're away from the environment that you are in, that you might be able to get some headspace, perhaps in your lunch break, to actually phone someone up and go and see someone, women's aid or, you know, speak to me by text messaging and get some relief. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm looking for funding. I don't know which way to go. There is um, on the suicide front, there because people get driven to suicide as I did through the um the emotional abuse and the pain that they feel when I can't go on any longer with feeling like this um so yeah I was t talking to because I'm going to college in September to learn Swedish massage um and I'm waiting for my offer letter um so that's absolutely awesome um and I was talking to the chap in student services now I asked him about um the suicide awareness and intervention and mental health and how could I get into the college and he went oh we're training our own people and I thought well, okay then right that's the door shut in my face and then I went so is there any other avenues that I could go down and he gave me the um the head of um suicide awareness and intervention right, um right. for Ellsbury council but they've it comes under something else I'm not sure what it is public health maybe so I need to go down that route um so yeah it's all about where do i go from here to get some funding to for me to be able to take this further mm -hmm. um it's all right doing the one-to-ones but i i feel that if i got a group of people i could do the how do you feel about it with the domestic abuse as well you know educate people into what it is what it isn't um squash their preconceived ideas of you know um everyone can leave if they want to leave you know um stand up for yourself you're a weak person mm -hmm. all the ones that you've probably heard as well you know that in reality it's not right and also you know there are people that would probably come to the groups that would actually sit there and say nothing but they're taking so much value away mm -hmm. and they would work on that with themselves you know and do it in their own time whereas you probably might get someone that's like oh my god I've been waiting three years to say something to you and they're talking for like 20 minutes yeah. you know and they're thinking god I'm just so self-obsessed with this but like you know that's what they need to do their outlet and then maybe they can move on to the next thing so yeah it's about uh, like abuse talk then just giving people to say what they need to say and you know get it out in the open because no abuse is good is it and it's not necessary and we don't tolerate it <laughs> well i wish you all the best with um you know looking into funding and on and, and your new course as well um so i have had a, a, a personal question uh, given to me and that is 
um, for you to answer. How, how can you trust again in a relationship after suffering with PTSD? How can I trust her? How can you trust again? So I think uh, this person's in a new relationship. Yeah, and she's got post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, right, well, firstly, um, this person's probably said this to their partner, um, but you need to actually say to them, you know, you need to understand where I've been. You will never truly understand where I've been and why I get these triggers. But, you know, don't take it personally. Um, and if you could support me through that, that would be absolutely fabulous because sometimes these are really intense and I understand that you can't actually, you're like, why the hell are you behaving like this? And you don't realise why the trigger is so intense. So, yeah, it comes back to, again, you know, just trying to get them to have an understanding on empathy. Mm. Um, on some sort of level of what you've been through and that is probably going to be part of their relationship and being with you for quite a while mm -hmm. and just learning to trust again really because mm -hmm. um, having flashbacks and reliving the memories um, can sometimes take a few days for you to reprocess that you know that is not your reality now yeah it's is that... difficult isn't it um and what yeah I'll do is, um i will connect you with this person after the interview so anybody who's watching that might be concerned about that person we are going to connect her with diane so thank you for that diane um and i've had another uh, lady ask um how can voluntary organizations refer to, to, to your services um just get in contact with me with my email really and then um and then we can meet the person it's as simple as that nothing too complicated i just need to have the initial email from you or even phone call um all my details are on melanin therapist so you'll be able to contact me there or my um my support group on facebook my secret support group on facebook so yeah, just um, just make contact with me and we can go from there. Yes. So if you are an agency and you've got a person, you know, we can go through, you know, who is this person, you know, directly with you. And then we can move on to who the person is um, and set up a plan really, maybe between us or you can just refer them on to me and we can start with the life circle um, and then see where we need to focus on first. That's great. So just to, to be clear, can you let everybody know where they can find you? So they can find you on Facebook. They can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, they can find me on Twitter. They can find me on numerous pages on Facebook. Um, they can find me on Melaland Therapy. So they can find me on Ellsbury Spiritual Meetup Growth Group. Okay. They can find me on Massage Matters, Berryfields Bear, Massage. Um, they can find me on Instagram as well. So there's lots of different places and I'm always keeping, um, keeping an eye on where they are as well. So my main two ones are hashtag Melaland Therapies and that will take you through to my Facebook page or www.melalandtherapies.co.uk. Well, thank you for that. And for everyone, I will pop all of that information <laughs> in the description. <laughs> so I haven't I have made you say it for no reason, but at the same time, it also you know gives that personal touch and people can have a look at it. So um, it is in the description of this video. And I just want to say a big thank you. To I'll send it to, through to you. I'll put it, send it through to you as well on the comment yeah. comments as well. So it's just there. That's fab. Um, well, thank you so much, Diane, for giving up your time. And That's fine. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I was panicking this morning. <laughs> <laughs>
panic at all. <laughs> no, you feel really relaxed, actually. So thank you very much for that. You're a fantastic interviewer. <laughs> well, thank you. well, I'm really glad because I think it's really important to, you know, share experiences and, you know, how people can support because it's not necessary that people can find the support, if that makes sense. So, in fact, sometimes I find it really difficult for, to find support for others as well. So having you... Yeah, back, well, I also in the last year i've um i've come off full-time meds now if you go to the doctors with depression and sometimes it's li linked with domestic abuse which mine was um predisposed to depression through my family um dna but it made it 10 times worse with my domestic violence and also i've come off my meds for the 24th of july no 24th of july it'll be a year and I was on meds for antidepressant meds for 13 years. So if people want, I can help them go through that process because cold turkey is not the way. And so many people do that. And that's why they fail. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I'm so pleased with myself coming up a year. Whoa. <laughs> you should be. And it's important to celebrate those successes. Um, you know so congratulations on that and you know you have mentioned there's been pinpoints and milestones that you've made throughout this whole interview and that I've picked up so you should be incredibly proud of what you're doing and especially because you're supporting others with that empathy and with the not the true knowledge of lived experiences which is valuable um so for everybody that's watching right now the next interview is on the 2nd of October can't believe I'm saying this because for everybody that doesn't realize we actually filmed this in July <laughs> so everybody um the next interview is the 2nd of October book it in your um diary have the space saved and if you are online right now you can pop over to hashtag abuse talk on twitter and we can have our discussion 